Some of you, no doubt, don't remember. Some of you weren't even here. But I believe it's been about 26 years since we've looked at the Ten Commandments. And so I thought, well, let's just take a look at them again. You know, it doesn't hurt to go over some of these things once in a while, does it? And so I want to do a series of on the Ten Commandments, so it'll be ten weeks. And I think we'll get done just before Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Palm Sunday, I think. We'll have to see how that goes. But anyway, uh, you know, it's really important, isn't it? God didn't just put these in there for to fill up a space in the, in the Bible or His Word or... Uh, you know, they're there for a purpose. They're there for us to to take the heart and to do what he wants for us to do. You know, God has something to say about the importance and uh, wants to get our attention. And, and you know, this was written, I, I realized that this was the Ten Commandments were basically written to the Old Testament believers. Uh, but it's, it's just as good today as it was back then, isn't it? You know, the Old Testament... Uh, these these Ten Commandments that we have, and actually there were a whole lot more that the Israelites got, but the Ten here are what we refer to all the time, uh, are just as just as valid today as they were way back in thousands of years there, even before Christ came. <clears throat> the laws of God are designed not to to uh, deny us anything that's good, but to help us in our Christian walk to do what he wants us to do. And you know, as we are obedient to him, <clears throat> that brings blessing, doesn't it? You know, I, I've mentioned this numerous times here, it seems like recently, but you don't bless a child that doesn't obey, that's very disobedient and unruly and things. You don't bless them. And the same is true with, I believe, with God. He's not going to bless us if we refuse to do what he wants for us to do. So. And that's only a choice that each one of us can make. I can't make it for you, you can't make it for me. It's a choice that each one of us has to make, whether we're going to be obedient to him or not be obedient to him. <clears throat> They're intended for our well-being and a guide to show us how best to live our life here on, on this earth. And from today until the time he comes back, uh, and that's going to happen one of these. F.B. Huey Jr. says, it is a mistake to emphasize one of these relationships to the exclusion of the other, the result will be an unbalanced expression of one's faith. Well, I'm going to just do this one here, but uh, you know, this one here is okay if I don't do that, or or uh, it's not as important as the other one. You know, each one of these are very important. They're all as important as the other one, isn't it? There's none that's more important than the other. Bernard Ram uh, says the Ten Commandments have come to be recognized as the basis of all public morality. You know, it's sad that they don't, the public, the world today and has been down through the centuries doesn't pay attention to that. But if they did, do you think our world would be the same if everybody obeyed the Ten Commandments? How about if they just obeyed, just obeyed the two that, that Jesus gave us in the New Testament? You know, our world would be definitely different, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be the same. It would be... Uh, the kind of world that we would like to live in. The first four show mankind, the mankind's relationship to God, and the last six are man's relationship to each other. And so he gives us the, the first four there to, to uh, show our relationship with God. J. Vernon McGee says, the Ten Commandments put before us God's standards. No man can play fast and loose with the Ten Commandments and get by with it. That's a true statement, isn't it? And yet it's pretty strong to say, you know, if I, if I don't want to obey or I don't obey the Ten Commandments, then, uh, you know, I'm not going to get away with it. God's not going to let me get away with it. And we can be thankful for that, that God corrects us when we need correction, just as we do with our children. When they get out of line, we need to correct them. And as a result of that, it makes a better child out of them, not a worse child out of them. You know, the, the philosophy sometimes is, well, if you spank your child, they'll hate you. You know, that's really not true, is it? And they, well, they might not like it, but it's for their better that they, that they are spanked and that they are, you know, uh, and I'm not talking about a beating or something like that. I'm talking about discipline in the right way. But uh, 
We just need to, to keep God's commandments that he's given to us. Are they too hard to do? Is it too hard to keep the commandments that he's given to us? You all look puzzled like, maybe it is. <laughs> it's not, is it? With God's help, we can do that. This is what he's promised, to give us the strength, the help that we need to keep these commandments. Keeping the law doesn't provide salvation, but it does give us a right relationship with God. As we, as we do what God wants us to do, that leaves us in a right relationship with him rather than having that relationship uh, hindered. It doesn't, we don't lose our salvation if we don't keep the Ten Commandments or any of the commandments that we have in Scripture, but it does hinder our relationship with God if we don't keep those, that what he wants us to do if we don't do what he wants us to do. You know, there's only one who's kept the whole law, and you know who that is, obviously. Jesus kept the whole law. He said he didn't come to, the, to get rid of the law, but he came to fulfill it, and he was able to do that. But you and I can't do that. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The law never made man a sinner. It just simply revealed the fact that he is a sinner. And as a result of that, we can, we can judge ourselves whether we are uh, doing what God wants us to do or not. The Ten Commandments uh, reveal who God is and what he's thinking. And I'm glad that we have that ability to at least read and learn some of the things that he's given us to think about. So, let's begin by looking at the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me and that's in verse 3 there and I believe the first three verses that Terry read therefore set the stage for the rest of the commandments that are coming up but uh, you know God spoke all these words saying I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage and then it goes on to have no other gods before me but this commandment is basic to all the others unless uh, unless God is unique and the only God none of the other commandments are binding upon mankind and this first commandment and the second commandment are awfully close so if you look at them you'll see that they're they're pretty close to the same and yet I believe there is some difference between the two you know the Israelites spent 400 years in Egypt and Egypt had all kinds of idols that they worshipped, all kinds of gods, I should say, that they worshipped. And in fact, uh, the ten plagues that God sent on them, Moses uh, brought on the, on the Pharaoh through God, that the ten, the, uh, the ten plagues were based on the, some, of the, some of the gods that they worshipped. And God says, you want to worship those gods? I'll give you something to worship. And he, he swamped them with, you remember the frogs? Their house was completely filled with frogs, their kitchens, their ovens, their beds, or every place you went there were frogs and then flies and, and on and on some of those different things that happened there. But God, being good to his chosen people, delivered them out of the bondage. But sad to say, they brought some of those ideas with them. After 400 years, they brought some of those ideas out with them in their idol worship. Look with me over in, in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verses 15 through 20. Exodus 32, 15 through 20, it says, And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of, of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other, uh, they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And then Joshua heard the, the noise of the people as they shouted. He said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the noise of the shout of victory, but the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of, uh, nor the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf, the dancing. So Moses' anger uh, became hot, 
And he cast the ta tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made, burned it in the fire, and ground it, ground it into powder, and he gathered and he scattered uh, it on the, on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. And then Moses said to Aaron, well, let me stop right there, uh, made him drink it. You know, Moses was up on the mountain talking with God and getting the Ten Commandments from God, and he came back down, and what happened? Aaron had made a, a, a calf for them to worship. And, you know, it wasn't only bad enough that they had the calf to worship, but Aaron said, and the people said, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. Wow. You think God's going to put up with that? Not very long, is he? In fact, not long at all. And uh, Moses ground up that calf into powder and put it in the water, and they had to drink it. And, you know, God isn't going to put up with that kind of stupidity, I guess. And yet, you know, they had worshipped these, I don't know how many worshipped these idols, and, and but they brought that out with them, and they wanted to make that idol and give that credit to God. Well, I can't think, I can't state as a fact, I believe that they, they say there is no God to worship of false idols, uh, false gods, and don't even know that they are doing so. They knew they were worshiping a false god. They knew that that was an idol and they should not be worshiping it, but they went ahead and did it anyhow. To those that say there is no God, what does the Bible say about them? Calls them a fool, doesn't it? You know, in, uh, in Psalm 53, 1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Boy, we sure have a lot of fools running around today, don't we? You know, and some of the major ones, uh, one of them at least knows now, and I'm sure others do too as well, but, uh, you know, one of them has since died, and uh, I think it was Hitch Hitchens, uh, Hitchkins, I think, that died. Anyway, one of him or the other guy, but, uh, huh? Yeah, that's sad though that they're, they're they're still fools. Whether they're educated or uneducated, they're still fools. And as a result of that, you know, they say there is no God. And this is this is what our kids are trying to be be taught. You know, and when they get into colleges, I understand the the professors there try to destroy their belief in God and and ridicule and make fun of them and things like this. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So if we don't want to be considered a fool, then we probably want to believe in God, don't we? Uh, it's only one choice or the other. And again, God doesn't take lightly the person that worships idols. To worship an idol of any kind is called sin. Ezekiel 18.4 says, The soul that sins shall die. You worship an idol, that's a sin. The soul that sins shall die. It's as simple and as positive as that you know that's a statement that god made and you can argue with it if you'd like to but uh, you're not going to win I'll, I'll guarantee you that the consequences of disobedience over in romans chapter 1 verse 8 romans chapter 1 or verse 18 i mean not verse 8 verse 18 says for the wrath of god is is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God is revealed against those that do that. And so you say there is no God and, and this is my God and I worship this. You know, and, and what are gods? Is that a little idol that you have to have sitting on your wall or some place like that? You know, Virginia has a cousin whose husband has a little, little fat Buddha there and he, he just praises that little Buddha you know, it's a sad situation, isn't it? But an idol, an idol can be anything. You have any idols? You know, sometimes we do, don't we? We have things that we, we put before God. And as I understand and believe, an idol is anything that takes away our, our thinking about God and our attention from God. If it comes between us and God, in other words, and I'll say this for myself, if I'd rather stay home and watch a football game then go to church and worship, uh, that would be an idol, wouldn't it? And it might be a short-term idol, but, uh, 
you know, it can be anything. It can be a, a new car, it can be a rifle, it can be a new dress, or you name whatever, and you, you can put anything you want, a person. Don't we have, a, what do they call that, American Idol, I think they call it? I've not watched it, but uh, I think that's what they call it. And, you know, just putting people on a pedestal and praising them, etc. Idols that God is not going to, to uh, put up with. The consequences of disobedient obedience. You know, I can't, when I think of that, I can't help but think of Achan. Do you remember that story of Achan in the Old Testament? Where they were getting ready to go into, into Jericho and conquer into the promised land and take the promised land and God says, don't take anything from, from Jericho other than certain things they could take, but don't take some other stuff. So what did Achan do? He took some other things he wasn't supposed to, wasn't he? And as a result of that disobedience, to God's command and guess what happened you know the rest of the story as Paul Harvey would say that uh, not only was Achan killed but his family was killed everything he owned was was destroyed uh, animals and and other things that he had there were completely destroyed why because he disobeyed God's command don't take anything and he did it anyhow and as a result of that he suffered the consequences and the sad part of it is not only him but his family and you know his, the animals and things that he had as well too and beyond that his sin caused Israel to lose when he went to battle at Ai if you remember they went up there and they lost 20 I think it was 26 or 36 people and if I understand correctly that was the only amount that they lost in all their battles and they lost that simply because of a uh, Achan the sin there at Jericho. Doesn't make a difference. The consequences of sin, there's a price to pay when we disobey God, when we don't do what he tells us to do. You say, well, huh, I've disobeyed God and he didn't strike me dead or he didn't do this to me or he didn't do that to me. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he's going to reap. And if you're going to reap these kinds of things, then not only will you reap them, but the Bible tells us that you'll reap the whirlwind a whole lot more than what you, what you, uh, you know, what you, you felt like you reaped. That's in Galatians chapter six, verse seven. Any group of people down through history who have turned their back on God has met defeat. It doesn't take long. I think they say, what, about 200 years, I think, is about as long as a, as a country goes. Uh, Rome, I think, uh, as a leader, a country there, I think, lasted about 200 years. Not the, you know, just as their, their power, so to speak. In the United States, we're just a little over 200 years, but uh, I don't think we're the power anywhere near that we used to be as a nation. But Moses went to bat. Do you remember when, uh, when... God was going to destroy his people. Look with me over in, in 32, in Exodus chapter 32. <coughs> Exodus chapter 32, uh, verses 7 through 14. Exodus 32, 7 through 14. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go get down, for your people whom you brought uh, out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves, and they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it, sanctified uh, and sanctified to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why, do, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them, to kill them, 
in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your wrath, uh, from your fierce wrath, and relent from this uh, harm to your people. Abraham, I mean, uh, yeah, and Abraham said, "Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land I, that I have spoken of, I give." you to your descendants that they shall inherit it forever so the lord relented from his harm that he was said he would do to his people if god if moses hadn't stepped in god was going to wipe them out wipe out his people and why because of their disobedience because they gave glory to a an idol instead of to him so do you think god takes disobedience lightly he certainly doesn't, does he? And we may think we're getting away with something, but in the long run, we're definitely not getting away with anything. <clears throat> Over in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and I'm just a couple of jumps ahead of Jerry on this here, so he's going through the book of Romans in, in uh, Sunday school class. But Romans 18, Romans 1, 18 through 25, you know, Paul, I believe, indicated that he would be willing to spend eternity in hell if God would just take away the uh, the things that he was going to do to his to his people. Happening in in Paul's time, Romans 1, 18 starts out, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who support who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that he that he may because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because altogether they knew God and they did not glorify him as God. And were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of corrupt, incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, that sounds like today, doesn't it? It sounds like if you were reading a, a newspaper today, you'd see that very same thing in there. Worshiping the creation rather than creator. And you know it's really sad when we would rather protect the the trees and the and the the animals and things like this and kill babies, uh, born or unborn, either one. You know what a sad, sad situation that is. <clears throat> How do you think God feels about the times in which we live? I think we got rougher times coming ahead of us over in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 says but know this that in the last days perilous times will come for when, for men will be lovers of themselves lovers of money boasters proud blasphemers uh, disobedient to parents unthankful unholy unloving unforgiving uh, slanders without self-control, uh, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. That's what God says is going to happen in the end in the end times. You think we're there? There's no doubt in my mind that we're there when you read this list of things that people are going to be doing and we see it happening all the time. 
what a sad sad situation is ours and and yet why is that happening simply because God won't people won't do what God tells them to do they want to do their own thing and uh, God's not going to put up with it and there's going to come a day of reckoning but not only are there consequences of disobedience but I think there's consequences or blessings of obedience over in Ephesians Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says blessed be the God and Father and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ blessed with the spiritual blessing every spiritual blessing uh, as believers as we do what God wants us to do obey him then God's going to bless us as a result of that God promises to bless to those who are willing to do what he wants them to do above and beyond what they can even imagine Matthew uh, chapter 7 verse 9 through 11 Matthew chapter 7 verses 9 through 11 Says, ask and it will be given to you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened to you for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened or what man is there among you who if he has a son asks for bread will give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will he give him a, a serpent if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more your heavenly father uh, will your heavenly father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him God wants to bless us God wants to bless his children but he can only do that if we're in obedience to him he's not going to bless us again if we're not in obedience to him I don't believe that God will and God cannot bless somebody who's not obeying God and his commandments that he's given to us you know numerous times God blessed the Israelites for their obedience but you know I wonder how many times did they miss out on God's blessing because they were disobedient now for us today how many times do we miss out on God's blessing because we're not doing what God wants us to do we're disobedient to him you know I believe that well, it's, it's unimaginable how many times, but I believe there's a lot of times when God would really love to bless us, but he can't because we're not doing what he wants for us to do. Shall so have no other gods before me. And that can be, again, anything. It doesn't have to be a little statue or a little idol or whatever else you might say. It can be anything, including those things, but anything else as well, too. <clears throat> So the question this morning is, who or what is your God? Who or what is our God? I include myself in there as well, too. If it's a God, then we're in trouble. If it's the God, then we'll be blessed as a result of that. If it's the only one and true, only one true God, uh, then we'll be blessed. You know, he didn't give the Israelites the Ten Commandments to make them uh, miserable and to make their life hard he gave it to them to be a blessing to them to help them to encourage them to to help them to be what he wanted them to, to be he knew what would give them the most out of life and make them very happy if they only obeyed <clears throat> they only obeyed him and yet so often they wouldn't you know the Israelites they were kind of like this weren't they up and down up and down I gotta go slower because the camera doesn't pick up when I go very fast and just shows a flash there anyway <clears throat> you know it's uh you know that their, their spiritual walk was up and down sometimes they did good most of the time after a certain point in time there they started doing what was not good <clears throat> We're to live and love God with our total being 
and our neighbor as ourself. Isn't that the commandment that Jesus gave to us when he was here on earth? He said, I'll give you two commandments. Love God with your, I like to say, your total being, your heart, soul, mind, and spirit. Love him with your total being and love your neighbor as yourself. That's all we have to do. Well, how you doing? How am I doing? Am I doing that? You know, when the neighbors aren't the most the kind people that we have, and you may have a neighbor like that or not, I don't know. But, uh, you know, do we, do we love them? Love your neighbor, love God, and love your neighbor is what he's looking for. You say, well, you don't know my neighbor. Uh, there's just nobody that can get along with them. What does Philippians 4.13 say? I can do all things through Christ with strength and with strengtheneth me. Let's say it together, should we? Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You know, and, and we can't do it in ourselves. It's impossible for us to do it in ourselves. But with his help we can. So I challenge us, myself and each one of us here, to uh to try to practice this more, to try to do what God wants us to do. And I believe God will let us know if we don't. I think he'll he'll say, you know, you should have done this or you should have done that. But uh, just to do what he wants us to do. And I believe that it's possible if we would just allow him to work and live his life in and through us. Last week we looked at Galatians 2.20. That uh, says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. You know, and uh, that's where it's at, isn't it? As we allow him to live in and through us, we can do these things that he wants for us to do. So just a challenge for today that uh, we do what God wants us to do rather than what we want to do or rather than what our neighbor wants us to do and, or someone else maybe that wants us to do something. But do what God wants you to do, and he'll bless you for it. Let's pray. Father, we thank